Shepherd my Ford's people, if you've been, you've seen this. It's funny because I use this commercial in a lesson about good deeds. <coughs> but it definitely is a two-fold commercial. And uh, like Carl and Julie would tell you, I am the king of the sad commercial cat, sad video. <laughs> Keeps the clean edges ready. You got some. <laughs> so today is the third week in fourth week and I love my church. And we're going to do it, we're going to talk about giving. So, it's uh, one of the tougher ones to do. Nobody likes to talk about it. Everybody gets asked to do it. So, <coughs> next week we'll, uh, we'll finish it up. And uh, we're going to do it in a way that you're probably not going to expect. Um, so be here next week for the conclusion of the series. And what I like to do is... Uh, quote right here. We make living by what we get, but we make a life by what we get. Winston Churchill. And um, when I was studying about this sermon, Winston Churchill has a lot of quotes like that. And he actually gave a whole bunch to the British people, more than he really gets credit for in the history books. But we're going to do something a little different. So before we get started this morning, I want everybody to take an item. If you can't get an item, raise your hand. Terry's going to bring one to you. I just want you to line up like we're doing communion. Come up and pick an item of your choice. Go back and sit down with it. But I need everybody to have an item. You too. You too. Anybody knows me, I don't do anything very traditionally. Everything I do is a little weird, a little odd, a little interactive. I want you to talk to me, I want to talk to you. countries in the world, giving over a piece of livelihood, seemed daunting, scary, sometimes downright senseless by the standards of many. So, the entire premise of biblical generosity begins with the acknowledgement that God created the earth and everything in it, including my life, your life, and everything we do in those lives. Now, when we offer our lives back to the Lord and surrender, we confess he is the owner, director, and source of all of it. We acknowledge that he not only blesses us abundantly, 
for the eternal gift of salvation. But that everything he's given us in this life is because of his unmerited grace. That even includes our ability to work to produce a livelihood. Now, as Moses proclaimed in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 17 through 18, you may say in your heart, My power and the strength of my hands have reduced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce this wealth. Amen. So, that being said, our giving is not meant to be obligatory or used as a way to earn God's favor because it doesn't work. It's meant to be done as an overflow of gratitude from our hearts, saying we are abundantly thankful for the things he's given us and recognize they are his and meant to be managed well for his purposes. <laughs> Giving back whatever is left over after we spend all what we think we need or want is not enough. The Bible says rather in giving of our first fruits or a regular piece of our income set aside for Christ and building up his church as we trust that he will take care of our every need is what he requires from us first and best. Giving lays the foundation for our spiritual surrender. As we lay down our means for livelihood to the one who gives us our livelihood to begin with, it's a physical act of surrender and trust in the security of our one and only refuge. It's also a vital practice when so many of us can be prone to say we trust in God to provide for us daily, but in our hearts we place more trust in the security provided by our own bank accounts. It's true. When we say that we need, part of our prayer is, Dear Lord, thank you for this book. Now, how many of you ever got a paycheck and said, Lord, thank you for this paycheck? I have a hard time with it. Like, man, I need you 80 hours. This is what I get. But we're getting better. At least my family's getting better at it, especially at the first three part. Above all, Given the act of worship, we make our faith real in the everyday, putting our words of surrender and trust into action in a tangible way. And it means so much more than just giving back to God in a financial offering, like Tara was saying. Biblical generosity should be laced into the fabric of our everyday lives. Beyond what we give to our primary call for giving, this is our primary call for giving, this is the church, we can generously display the love of Christ and how we did how we maybe pay for somebody's meal, forgo a monthly shopping for to contribute to a friend's mission trip, cook a meal for a return, friend returned from the hospital. Countless other ways that we can think about to contribute to biblical generosity. We can be generous daily if we reconfigure the way we think about our money. From ours to his, given to us for our joy to accomplish his purpose. It's a mouthful of sentences, and I'll say it more time. We can gen give generously daily if we reconfigure the way we think about our money. From ours to his, given to us to accomplish his purposes and be a blessing to others. Amen. Amen. But I like that. I liked it when I wrote it. Amen. 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 It's a lot of things on it. So whenever I speak on the stuff of giving, I'm aware that I'm dealing with a very sensitive area where people are easily offended. The church is always after my money. It's a common complaint. I'm also reminded of a comment from a preacher I heard as a child that stuck with me. When you throw a rock at a pack of dogs and one of them yelps, you know which one got hit. That's right. So before we yelp about this sermon, we better think about whether the word of God may be hitting us where it hurts. Mm -hmm. Now the Bible speaks very plainly about money, because our hearts and wallets are tightly bound together. Stats are kind of a hobby of mine. I, I like statisticians, I like stats. And I found them pretty good ones. Come from Howard L. Dayton Jr. Leadership Academy, spring 1981, page 62. <laughs> 16 of 38 parables deal with how to handle money and possessions in the Bible. In the Gospels, one out of every 10 verses, one 288 in all, deal directly with money. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, 
for more than 2,000 verses on money and possession. How important is that? Uh, very the most. Amen. 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 So, just to show you how easy this can be, I'll show you one more thing. smile back at me, I probably think you're being good. But it won't fool God. Paul wrote to the Philippians who had given sacrificially to meet his needs. And he gives us one of the most comforting promises in the Bible. 
Paul says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If we meet the condition, give faithfully, God will fulfill his part. Supply all our needs. <coughs> so, what's faithful giving? <coughs> the principle for faithful giving. Faithful giving should be one of the first things we establish on our Christian wall. Paul commands the Philippian church. Commands the Philippian church. By reminding them of how, at the first preaching of the gospel, after he departed from the region, which was Mesopotamia, they shared with him in the matter of giving and receiving. At that point, they were the only church that took initiative to send support to Paul. Even when he was still in Macedonia, the Thessalonians, more than once, they sent gifts to him. Now, apparently, these gifts weren't enough to provide full support. Because he reminds the Thessalonians how he worked with his hands to provide for his needs when he was still with them. But right from the start of their Christian experience, the Philippians gave. Now Paul taught that it's proper for a man who labors in the gospel to receive his support from the gospel. But, for the sake of avoiding the charge that he was preaching for the money, Paul chose not to receive support from a new church where he was ministering while he was there. Instead, he supported himself by making tents. But if fun came from another church outside the area, he would immediately stop making the tents and go back and redevote himself to ministering full time. Paul never seemed to make his needs known, even his prayer requests, but trusted in the sovereign God to provide. When fun ran low, he went back to work until God met his needs. Paul must have taught the Philippians early on the importance of faithful giving. Support those in Christian ministry because soon after he left town, the Philippians sent gifts after him. Now Jesus taught the same principle in Luke 16, 10 through 16. After giving the parable of the unrighteous steward, which has to do with money, he said, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. He goes on to show that the little thing, <coughs> I had to look this word up too, is our use of unrighteous mama. Now, mammon means money. It's mentioned quite often in the Bible. If we are faithful in how we use our money to advance his kingdom, the Lord will then entrust true riches to us, which in the context of Luke are souls. If we want God to entrust us with souls, we begin by providing our faithfulness in what to us is a big thing, which is mammon. But to God is a little thing. The use of our money. That's his test. So financial faithfulness, which includes giving, but also how we manage all the material goods God has entrusted to us, earning, spending, saving, should be one of the first lessons we learn. Now, since that should be one of the first lessons we learn, we also need to learn to take the initiative in looking for the faithful Christian workers who are focused on the glory of God and the work of the, of the gospel. As Paul was. And support them without being pressured to give. It's a sad commentary on the American church. We live in relative luxury, while faithful servants of the Lord are being held up from going to the field because of a lack of funds. Or they have to come back from the field, from missions, to get more funds. Now, many American Christians are so used to the pressure of fields, um, especially the 80s, 90s, the TV preachers. I need your gift now, or my ministry is going under. We overlook the faithful servants of the Lord who are not so thoughtful in their appeals for funds. Now, in our own church, we have faithful people who are doing the Lord's work. Don't assume that all their financial needs are met. Like the Philippian church was called, take the initiative to support that. Um, this church did a great job with Taylor, which was Costa Rica. I went to Buffalo Wild Wings. Because I'm a fat boy, I like Buffalo Wild Wings, and it was fun right there in the street. If you're not sure of their need, ask them. Keep in contact. Direct some of the resources God has entrusted to you to help support them in his work. Principle number two. Faithful giving should be focused on the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Paul was preaching the gospel. He was giving each church where he worked an example of his hard work and his freedom from greed. If I don't have the money, I'll go out and work for it. When the money comes, I'll spend more time. 
Now, there are those who claim to be serving the Lord. They're lazy and greedy. Don't give in to that. If a TV or radio preacher pleads for money, saying that his ministry will go under, if you don't save your gift today, let it go under because it's not for God anyway. It's for man. Amen. 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 If he's living in luxury, let him sell some of his possessions. Mm -hmm. Give it to his own ministry. The famous British preacher, great guy. You ever get to read something about him? Great. C.H. Spurgeon. Once received a request from a wealthy man to come to their town and help them raise funds for a new church building. He told Spurgeon he could put him up in his country home and he'd be happy as he could be. Spurgeon wrote back and told him, sell the house and give the money to the project. Hmm. <laughs> give to those who emphasize ministry, not money. Amen. 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 Now, Paul's focus was on preaching the gospel, not on his need for money. Now, while he generally appreciated the gifts from the Philippians, he was more excited about what it signified about their heart for God. That it represented fruit occurring in their account in heaven. Now, for himself, Paul lived by faith and was content with whatever God provided. But he never made strong appeals for himself. But what he did do was make strong appeals for funds for others. In 2 Corinthians 8 9, he appealed strongly to them to give generously to meet the needs of the poor Christians in Judea. Of course, he would never stoop to some of the fundraising gimmicks used by various ministries and churches in our day. Worst one, setting up prayer cloths for contributions. He appealed to them to give faith on God's gracious gift of his son, Jesus Christ, for us. He was also scrupulous not to take advantage of anyone in financial matters, but to keep his focus on ministry. So look for faithful servants or ministries that you support, that you like, that you might be interested in, who are focused on the furtherance of the gospel, and get faithfully to them. Now, our third principle is faithfully giving is investing in eternity. Paul says, I'm looking for the profit that increases to your account. And these were common accounting words, even then. Paul is saying that when you give to the Lord's work, you're putting money into your account in the bank of heaven. And it pays guaranteed high interest for all eternity. Now, if you have any money invested in stocks and mutual funds, you realize that the riskier your investment, the greater the chances that you can make high return. But also the greater the chance that you can lose a lot. And even the safe investments have no guarantee, as it is. <laughs> Some of us figured it out not too many years ago, in 2008. But when you invest in God's work, there is no risk. And you get the highest possible return on your investment, guaranteed by the Word of God. In Luke 16, 1 through 9, Jesus tells the parable of the crooked steward. He was being called on the carpet for squandering his master possessions. He knew he was going to lose his job. He didn't want to be a beggar. He's too weak to dig ditches. So he quickly called those who owed his master and reduced their bills. Since he knew that his time was short, he made friends for himself in high places so that in the future they would welcome him. Now, don't get this twisted. Jesus isn't praising the steward's dishonesty, but rather his foresight. He's telling us, for the short time we have left on this earth, to use our master's money to make friends for eternity, to see people come to Christ. Then when we step into heaven, it's all of us. By giving to the Lord's work, you're investing his souls for all eternity. Smartest investment you can make. And our fourth friend, faithful giving should be motivated by worship. Paul calls their gift a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice while pleasing to God. Now, these terms come out of the Old Testament, where they describe the sacrifices that worshippers offered to God. Um, one of the most famous is Cain and Abel. Right. They also are used in the New Testament to describe Christ's offering, of, Christ's offering of himself for our sins. The point is, you aren't given to the pastor, you're not given to the church, you aren't given to the missionaries, or the mission organization. You are given to God himself. 
Think about this first. If Jesus Christ bodily walked into this church, if he was the usher handing you that basket, and you saw the nail scars on his hands, they would pierce for you. If that money was going to him personally for his support, would you give any differently than you do now that you did today? Would you grab him and say, all right, here's a few bucks? Would you give gracefully out of your heart of love and worship that could be gave himself for you? Suppose I gave him my wife a gift on Valentine's Day. How would you feel if I said, well, I don't really even want to. You know, it's a, it's a Hallmark holiday, but I haven't got you anything in a while. Feeling kind of guilty. I know the neighbor's wife got her something outstanding, but, you know, he makes more money than I do. <laughs> I know it's my duty to introduce you to give myself. She wouldn't be well pleased because my motive was wrong. But if I said, honey, you deserve even more than I could ever give you. But I love you so much, I put so much thought in this gift, and I was thinking of you when I bought it. That very same gift is now well pleasing. The value of the gift didn't change, but the way I gave it did. That's how we should give to God. Out of our hearts and love and gratitude to glorify it, not out of obligation or guilt. Now, if our giving is done as an act of worship to glorify God, then we won't want to advertise how much we're giving. Many Christian ministers cater to the flesh when they put up plaques and memorial books for the names and donors. The best plaque I saw while I was putting their sermon together is one of the village of Camp Crusades Arrowhead Springs that reads This village was donated by five businessmen. Who want the glory to go to God. Amen. Amen. Great plaque. Just so you know, <laughs> that camp is 1,600 acres long and has 19 full service youth buildings on it. Outstanding. Thus, we are to give faithfully to our Lord's work to further the gospel out of a heart of worship to our Lord who gave himself for our sins. If we do, God promises something. Faithful givers can count on the faithful God's faithful supply. Now Paul said, by God, so supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, my God in Christ Jesus. Here again is Paul's intimate personal relationship with his Savior. Given to the Lord's work is not for anyone who does not know him through the cross. If you know him as my God, if you know that by faith you are in Christ Jesus, then the privilege of giving and the promise of God's faithfulness apply to you. If you don't know Christ, you can't give to him until you receive his gift. Because you don't know what you're getting in return. You don't know what a privilege it is. You don't know what was given for you. There's none other than God who spoke the universe into existence who promises to supply your need when you give faithfully, even though it's called self-experience. And this is where this is where it gets a little, little testy. Paul himself experience, and we have too. You may suffer some tight times. Your needs, not your luxury. This is not prosperity theology. Will be met. And you will have far more, namely the great joy of fellowship with the Creator and Savior. Now, the sufficiency of the promise is the riches of God for all my needs. The key mind, the Bible keeps saying, my needs, my needs, my needs, my needs, my needs. We did a four lesson on needs and wants. He promises to supply all our needs according to, not out of, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Staggering promise. The God who owns the whole earth said that he will meet our needs if we give faithfully. And it is a blessed thing to know, to know this in your experience as you watch it. You know, as you, you know, Forge is a great example. It's so small, and, and there's so many people in the community, so many people in the church came to it, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it's still growing. Mm -hmm. And we all got to see that. This Barbara, this Carla, this Julie, everybody who was here at the inception of Forge, you've seen it. And, and it, it was miraculous. It was great, you know, and it still grows. American pastor William Jackson had a family tragedy occur. It made it necessary for him to travel to the West Coast. A banker who attended his church visited with him just before he left. 
And at least I talked, the banker took out a piece of paper out of his pocket and slipped it into the pastor's hand. Chapman looked at it and saw there was a blank check made out to him, signed by the banker. And momentarily was stunned, he asked. Do you mean you're giving me a signed check to be filled out as I please? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying, said the banker. I don't know how much you might need. And I want you to draw any amount that will meet your need. Chapman gratefully took the check, but he didn't need to use it on this trip. Later in the sermon, he commented, it gave me a comfortable, happy feeling to know that I had a vast sum at my disposal. Our supply is, is as sufficient as the bank of heaven. A blank check for all our needs. Got a question for you. How do we know the check's good? We all know blank checks are no good if the person who signs them is destitute or a crook. But if the check is signed by my God, the God I know personally, the God who is also our Father, the God who has never in human history failed his children, the God who demonstrated his great love for us by giving his only son on the cross, then the check is good. good. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how would he not also with him freely give us all things? Romans 8, verse 32. If we meet the condition by giving faithfully, the promise is certain. Our God and Father will meet our needs, and you can count on it. We've seen it. The reason you're given is a pretty good gauge of your spiritual life is that your heart is bound up with your treasure. Jesus taught where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you want your heart to be with the Lord, put your money in the Lord's work. If you want your heart to be in this evil world, put your money in the things of the world. I did it for a lot of years. Some of you heard some of my testimony when I spoke last year. Let me tell you, well, nobody thought about Rob like it was Rob thought about Rob. If I wanted it, I went, yeah. Not because I earned it, but because I deserved it. It's a simple principle to state, but not so simple to implement because it requires faith. Now, to give generously to the Lord's work requires that you believe that there really is a heaven ahead. Since you plan to spend eternity there, you put your money over on the other side in advance. Where's our interest? In heaven bank, awaiting your arrival. Jesus called it laying up treasures in heaven. <coughs> I like that phrase. Laying up treasures in heaven. Amen. <coughs> So it's like the story of the sailor who was shipwrecked. I love stories. This story. Shipwrecked on a South Sea island. He was seized by the natives who carried him to their village, set him on a crude throne. They treated him as royalty. So soon he learned that their custom was once a year to make a man king for a year. He thought it was a pretty good deal. So he started wondering what happened to all the other former kings. <laughs> he found out that after the year, the kings were banished to a desert island where they starved to death. Now this worried him, but he was a smart king. So he put his carpenters to work, sent them over to the deserted island, had him make him a house. Gardeners worked transplanting fruit trees and other crops to the island where he would be banished. Carpenters built a beautiful house. So when his year was over, he was banished not to a barren island, but to an island of abundance. In the same way, if we really believe that this life is temporary and eternity is ahead, Eternity is ahead. We need to be sending our treasures over to that side by our giving. Amen. So we'll have something there waiting for our arrival. Do we want to go to a barren island? Do we want to go where we've been investing our whole lives? Yes. Our whole Christian lives. We've been investing to where we all say we're going to spend eternity. <coughs> giving generously also takes faith because you have to trust that when you give away your money, God's going to make it up. I provide for your immediate needs. What if I give and then some unexpected emergency comes up? What if I give and I lose my job? Anybody who knows where I work? It's a rough place there right now. Yeah. I heard of a fellow who was struggling with the idea of giving 10% of his income to the church. He told his pastor he didn't see how he was going to do it and keep up with his bills. The pastor came up with a great idea. If I promise to make up the difference in your bills, you should fall short and you think you could try tithing for just one month. 
after thinking about it for a moment or twice and sure. If you're gonna make up the difference, I'll give you anything if I want. See the problem with that, number one. Where's the faith in that? Right? Pastor responded, so what do you think of that? You say you'd be willing to put your trust in a mere man like myself. Little bit of material stuff I got, but you couldn't trust your heavenly father who owns the whole universe. Let's quote here. Just so you know, um, uh, Mother Teresa, who just cat and I, by the way. Yeah. If you can't feed a hundred people, to feed just one. It's pretty powerful, and a lot of things that Mother Teresa said are very, a lot of comedy too. They're very short, they're very concise, and they're very precise. So that's the issue of the heart of the matter of faithful giving. We you trust the living God who gave His Son for you. I give it generously and systematically. I have a heart of gratitude, love, and worship. If you do, he promises to meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This morning we covered a lot about giving. Heard some things that weren't easy to give. Talked about God taking care of us who were willing to sacrifice him and his works. I'm here to tell you, none of that matters. <coughs> if you haven't received God's gift to you, how can we turn our finances over if we haven't turned over our lives? Yes, God says that we should give to the needy, the ones doing his work. Do it without contempt. But if you don't know salvation, then you're just giving. You're not investing in your heavenly account. I want you to know if you don't have anything invested in heaven, it's not too late. You don't know when. But what if it's this afternoon? Do you have money in the bank, Adam? Has your time on earth been pleasing to God or just pleasing to you? If you're not sure, then fix it today. So, everybody's got an item in their hand? Here's what I want you to do. Don't leave those items here in this church. I want you to take those items and I want you to give it to somebody outside of this church. It doesn't even matter what the item is. Give it to somebody. <coughs> These items you have, they're small to you. But to someone else, they may be just as they need to feel wanted. Or to feel that you cared enough to give a moment of your time. Maybe just an excuse to talk to them about Christ. Might be an excuse to invite them to church. Might be an excuse to invite them to the concert on Thursday. Any reason. Our time isn't limitless. You know, one of the one of the funniest things I heard when I was growing up was wisdom is wasted on a youth. That's what I They get older. So now I'm getting older. I wasted a lot of wisdom in my youth. These items. Use them to further God. Use them as a tangible object to talk to somebody. Um, when I started doing this sermon, and, and I'm going to call for Sherry now, these little bears, she came to the wedding. The look of excitement on this lady's face when I stuck a bear up in fire fire truck was just immense. To me, it was a small thing, man. I ride that thing all the time. Usually, I'm going to get hot and sweaty and I'm going to run in somewhere. But to her, it was the greatest thing on the planet. And when I'm writing this, I'm thinking, how many times do I run into small things that are small to me and they're huge to somebody else? You know, Forge, for us, has done it a lot. People will come up to me or tell me, how did you know I needed to hear that? We don't. When God tells us what we're supposed to talk about before the church, after church, before church, she really means it. She says it all the time. It's not my words, or Pastor Rob's words, or her words. It's God's words. Amen. 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 So true. The greatest thing you can do is listen. Just Amen. listen. Amen. The next Amen. greatest thing you can do is start investing in eternity, not tomorrow. Yeah. 
Don't be invested next week. Invest in your heavenly future. I love it when she says it doesn't have to be money. It can be time. It can be talking. Um, I just wanted to get to share. You used to work with her back when I said, I'm drilling, I'm drilling, and, and my phone is on because I don't do manual labor. I love my cookie little state job. And I'm sweating, and I, I knocked on the door. I said, I'm done. She said, you know, I really appreciate that. I said, but my hand. She said, you know, but it's been needing to be done for, like, forever. And I really appreciate it. And once again, it was a small thing to me, but to her, it was huge. So what I'm saying is consciously think about the next person. Consciously do it, and you'll be amazed what you see. You'll be amazed. That video, $20 to them, was immense. Matter of fact, the woman was a young woman because she thought there was things that tied to it. You could see it on her face. Right. You know, the, the other guy on the bench, you know, he ends in 20, he needed a little looks around. He's, you know, got 70 right. miles. Sure you, you know, $20 was huge to them. And the guy wasn't rich, and he had lots of videos, by the way. He wasn't rich, but it's what he's called to do. So, <clears throat> Really look at yourself. And as we close this morning, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to urge you really to look inside. Master, your offer is pleasing to God. Now, if you feel moved today to give more to God, to put more in your heavenly bank account, something we've never done before. And I, I purposely didn't say anything about a sermon or the item today because I wanted you to give your thighs. But you normally do. And we appreciate it. Don't ever think we don't. But there's a box by the front door. And if you haven't put it up in your heavenly account or you feel there's a ministry that you want to support, throw something in that box. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's money. I don't care if it's a note that says good job. I don't care if it's something that says keep doing what you're doing. I don't care if it says thank you. Something. Remember, it's easy to get wrapped up in the here and now. It's really easy. I was really good at it. I can never emphasize that to you. Not, not even a full blowed out testimonial. I can never emphasize oh, I was really good at taking care of me at the expense of everybody around me and everybody around them, and half time, everybody around them. Yeah. And once I started having some faith that somebody else was willing to take care of me besides me, my life changed. God put the greatest person in my life I could ever imagine. I never saw that coming. And how many gave me one of them, he gave me three of them, and he gave me a full family too. To say, hey, don't mess this one. None of it would have been possible until I started thanking my heavenly account. Until I started having faith that God will take care of me. Until I started not just reading the Bible, but believing the Bible. Satan can read the Bible. Satan can quote the Bible. Did a lesson on God's armor. Went piece by piece. What each piece means. If you don't have it on at all times, don't ever think Satan ain't waiting to chink away the piece that's missing. Thank everybody for listening to me today. It's a tough subject. Hopefully I express, express it well. Paul is a great book. Um, I purposely didn't put the Bible verses up on the uh, screen because I do want you to start reading and believing what you read. As you go out, there's a stack of cards of all the Bible verses I use when I put this sermon together. Grab a card and you can look at them at home. You can look them up at your leisure. If you have any questions, Almost everybody you can have my number. If you don't come see me, I'll give it to you. And I'll tell you what I got out of my reading out of it. If you don't understand something, call me. I'll do my best to explain it. But if I can't explain it, I'll find you somebody that can. So, <clears throat> just want to say a closing prayer. And uh, we'll 
uh, with our benediction, and we'll go on a football Sunday. <laughs> Seven days. Go Redskins! <laughs> Ravens! Ravens! Boo! <laughs> hey, that's going to be a crowd back involved to say football. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you for your most precious gift for your son, Jesus Christ, this morning. We pray that each of us here are pleasing you with the offerings we give, whether it's time, money, or compassion. Lord, we know that all we have is because of you and your grace. Please help us understand, without investing in our heavenly account, we're missing out on our eternal riches and only living an earthly life. Lord, please be with all who need your comfort, guidance, and understanding. Be with everyone who travel home today, throughout the week. In your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thursday, please come out, invite a friend, um, come check the concert out. Um, <coughs> next week, we're going to talk about sharing. It's not going to be like anything you expect. Um, to be the conclusion of the sermon series, I love my church. Um, I actually wanted to look, I was going to wear my, my t shirt today, but I kind of wanted to look decent. So I figured I'll put on a decent shirt. So what I do. I don't burn the whole room. Oops. Oops. But at least I didn't hurt my shirt. So. Oh, happy birthday, Jay. With that being said. I completely forgot. Um, come back next week for the conclusion. <laughs> and uh, we'll go ahead and finish up with our benediction. Don't forget Thursday. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Don't forget about the barbecue next week. Don't forget about Bible study on Wednesday. Don't forget about Bible study on Wednesday. Take those tickets and hand them out. This is the last chance. Morning, morning. Morning, morning. <laughs> if, we want, if we want more national groups, we got to make sure this one turns out okay. Find somebody's need and give at least once this week. I, I, I made it easy for you. I gave you the item. I did everything but go and find the person for you. I, I can't do nothing else. There's nothing else we can do. Only you can grow this church. Only you can invite people to get here. Only you can take the time to talk to somebody who may actually need it. 